Okay, everyone, uh, let's get underway today. Um, thanks everyone for joining us once again on the uh, Dara e-seminar uh, list. Um, so it's uh, a real pleasure today to welcome uh, uh, Bernardo Sabre uh, from uh, GSSTI and, uh, and Astron. Uh, so I've known Bernard <laughs> for many years now uh, from our time uh, in Ghana. He's been a real, uh, again, another stalwart supporter of the, uh, all the efforts of the DARA program over the years. Uh, it's been a great help in uh, managing and running a lot of the uh, training programs uh, mm -hmm. that we had, especially at the uh, antenna uh, at Katunze uh, in, uh, in Ghana. Um, so Bernard uh, did his first degree at uh, KNUST in Ghana uh, before uh, going to Sweden for a master's at Chalmers and then uh, also continuing his Swedish connections for PhD with uh, Onsler, but also uh, in South Africa with uh, University of Johannesburg uh, before returning to Ghana um, as uh, employee of uh, the GSSTI that runs the, uh, the dish there. Um, but for a few years now and a couple of years more, then uh, he's been uh, honing his radio astronomy skills uh, at uh, Astron in the Netherlands, uh, where he's currently a science operations and support officer. Uh, and as we shall hear today, uh, principally involved with the, uh, the LOFAR telescope. Uh, so as I'm sure Bernard will, will tell us, then, uh, LOFAR is really more of a forerunner for the sort of the other part of the SKA that we haven't really touched upon much yet in our e-seminar series. Uh, it's, it's, the, the, it's a low frequency telescope, so very similar to what SKA low in Australia will be uh, all about. And so uh, LOFAR is a kind of fantastic sort of uh, forerunner to the, to the science that um, SKA low will do. Uh, so the bit that, that will be in Australia rather than in uh, Africa. So I'll uh, hand over to, to Bernard. As always, if you, have, if you think of questions as you're going through, then uh, just pop them in the Q&A box, not, not the chat box, but in the Q&A box. Um, you know, pop them in there as soon as you think of them so you don't forget and I can see them then. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll, you know, after a 40 minutes talk, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll address the questions. Okay, so uh, take it away, Bernard. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Melvin, for the opportunity to uh, speak to my colleagues on the DARA uh, project. Just as Melvin mentioned, I'm currently with Astron, and my job position is science operations and uh, support officer. And just as he said, I'll be here for a couple a couple of years more before I move back to my post in Ghana. So uh, to move on, I, 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 I want to present the complex strong uh, system in a very simple uh, form this evening. So I will make sure I avoid any complexity because the purpose of this is to introduce you to what we have here at Astron, the science you can do, and the opportunities that can be available to you, as there has been one here for me. So that is basically the, so I'm not going to touch so much on the complexity and then the, the, the deeper things, but in every situation, whatever information we need, I can also point you to, uh, to that. So I will introduce Astron, and tell you a, a brief overview of the LOFA system. And then I'll also highlight how we get proposals, ask from uh, LOFA proposals, and come out with science output. Then I'll mention how you can get in, yes, as I've been here now, and tell you where LOFA is going uh, in the next couple of years. And I'll give you some summary and links that uh, will help you if you want to understand more of the LOFAR system. Uh, if you log in to the Astron webpage, which is www.astron.nl, this is exactly what you see. 
And most of the things I'm talking, I'm going to talk about this evening, uh, you can find uh, most of them uh, at the link. So luckily today uh, I was featured, this week I was featured in the uh, Aston web, on the Aston web page. So, uh, yes, I said, I've put here on the organogram to the right, I've put here Astron uh, 1.0. Uh, that this is the organogram of Astron. I'm saying 1.0 because uh, we, are, we have moved to what we call a second phase of Astron or Astron uh, 2.0. So this is actually what until 1st September, this was the organogram of the Astron uh, Institute. Let me mention that Astron has been around for a, for a while now, maybe since uh, 1964. But LUFA came into being just 10 years ago. So on the 12th of uh, June this year, we celebrated as, uh, LUFA's 10th uh, anniversary. Aston has been involved and is still involved in research and development of systems and subsystems of uh, telescopes and others, and then also into sciences and engineering uh, researches. But what I'm involved now, as I introduce myself, is uh, on telescope operations. So I will talk much about that uh, from that perspective. Now, if you look at the old Aston structure, I just want us to focus on the radio observatory here. Now, radio observatory have three main groups. There's operations and maintenance, software group, and then science operations and support group. So I was in the old uh, Aston, I was with the science operations and support group. And the people in this group are having job title telescope scientists. I'm the only one who is a science operation and support officer uh, at the Institute uh, as of today. And when it comes to operation in the old Astron, the operations were done by the three groups under the radio observatory. So we're playing head to head with each other to make sure LUFA and other Astron uh, facilities operations are done uh, smoothly. Now this is the Astron 2.0. And as I said, it has been effective from 1st of September uh, this year. We have three, four main uh, groups that uh, is Astron now. And by these groups, Astron is into so many things. We are now, one mega thing that we are going to do is data science. Uh, center. We are going to have a huge data science center, not just for the coming SKA and the LOFA data sets, but something that will be bigger than that. And if you look at the organogram, we, Astron for now, is involved in high performance computing, research in science engineering, uh, and then receiver development, calibration and imaging. And besides, uh, we are also operating LOFA and the former Westerbock radio telescope, which is now used for two uh, main types of observations or two main types of instruments. We are using it for the EV and the VLB observation for the standing dishes, and then another project we call Appetit. But I will focus today on the LOFA system. So just to show you what the new Astron is. Okay, so uh, like I said, in this new Astron, operations of all the facilities that Astron is running, which I've put down here, but I'm just going to focus only on the LOFA. So operations now is done by two main groups, the radio teles uh, the telescope operations and then science data center operations. These two groups are going to be uh, taking care of operations of the telescope. But that aside, we are also going to, after the two, I mean, under the astronomy and ast astronomy and operations group, we have these uh, groups. So besides the first two groups I have circled, the rest of them, we refer to them as uh, focus groups. So they are also going to help. 
And then we have also a software delivery group here. People will also be supporting operations as well as uh, colleagues from the business support and services uh, department. So what we are going to do is we are going to get people from the different departments who are going to support operations. Okay. Now, like I said, I'm going to present Astron and Lofa, in fact, in the simplest form. So if there's anything complex, which looking at the participants are not used to, I will just make sure that I point to the list or I point to the, the what you call it, the, the link where you can find much information on. These are more useful, like I said, for this one hour or so, I will not be able to tell anything about Astron. I've been, I've been at Astron for almost a year and a half now. And uh, even now, there are a lot that still need to understand. So I wouldn't expect to be able to cover all that I need to talk about within this time slot. So, so I have embedded some links in these texts on the left here, which when you click, will take you to the right pages where you can find the other information that you need. But what I want to focus here now is, uh, if you want to understand or you have a question and you want to find out, you can always talk to Astron using this help desk. So if you click on this link, I'll show you exactly how we do it. To get you to your page where you fill in your details and tell what, what question you have and you will be responded to. Most of the ticket that comes, uh, I think in most of them, I am the one who respond to the requests or the concerns of users, except those that I won't be able to then I pass on to my senior colleagues. Uh, so this link here also guides you on how you can submit a ticket. So that is the submission guidelines. And if you want to follow activities of LOFA, at this link also, you can find the LOFA activity calendar and you will be able to know exactly what is happening and what. And you can also subscribe to the LOFA mailing list by clicking on this link. Now, what you do here is you require to send an email to Roberto and he will add you to the mailing list so that whatever information that is, you will get that. An important, uh, important link is Lofa Slice and Repository. Everything that we are talking about, every, everything we do in uh, Astron, presentation schools, meetings, and we always collect the slides. So if we come to this page, you have all the schools, all the meetings, and the slides are here. So whatever thing that we, we are talking about here, you can find them in this repository. And the important link here is I was tasked, so I was tasked uh, last month to come out with frequently asked questions. So if you click at this link, I've, make, I've made a provision for everything that you want to know about uh, LOFA and Astron. So these are some of the places that you can get more about Astron. Now, I also want to mention that I said that if you want to find information from Astron, it is www.aston.nl. By currently, we are upgrading, updating the, upgrading and updating the Astron webpage. So sometimes when you, you type something at the webpage and then it, does, it gives you wrong. If you have put www there, change the www to old. And if it is old and it's giving you a wrong, it's wrong, change it to www. So these are some of the things you need to note now. So that any web page that you click, if the first three decades after the slash, double slash is old and it's giving you a, 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 it's not directing you to that page, then you put www there and otherwise. Now, uh, because most of us here on the data program, uh, LoFi is new to us, I want to show you briefly how you can create a help desk First, if you want to create a help desk ticket, you must, or you must first be a member or must have be a member of the Astron community. 
So what to do that, you need, you need to have Lofa user accounts. So let me quickly take you through how to create Lofa user accounts so that you'll be able to submit tickets or requests or questions to the Housestrong uh, help desk for response. So to do that, uh, you click on this link. I've, I've, I've embedded a link in the Lofa user accounts there. So if you click there to get you to your page, so it's a three step pages, three pages. So the first one, you supply information about yourself, about your institution, and then it, you get an overview. When you, when you click uh, register, then you will be uh, given the opportunity to change your password and then you become a member or you become, uh, you have a, what do you call it, LOFA user account. This is important because you can, with the LOFA user accounts, you can assess the LOFA, LOFA system. You can also communicate with the, with Astron and with the LOVA uh, observatory. And then another important thing that you also, I want to mention is anytime you have a, a question, a request, and you want to communicate or you want to find out, want to ask, this is also the help desk. After you have created your LOVA account, you can click this link and then this page comes out. So this is again the Astron uh, address. Again, if you click there and you get the, the, the miss error, then you should remember exactly what I said. And there, there are three things that you can, people can ask, normally ask. Whether you want to talk to, you have a question, you want to ask the science operations and support, or you have a suggestion for Astron, or you have something that you want to debug. But let's know that in the coming weeks, uh, the Aston webpage updates of the because of the new structure that we have in Aston, the term ready observatory and then science operation and support will not be found there. If you see any other thing, that shouldn't be a case. So when you click this page, and for example, I want to submit a request, I click on the science, uh, science operations and support. This is the page I come to. All I need to do here is because I've registered as a member, when I click here, when I click here and come to this point, I will have my name there, or your name will be there. Put up the summary of what you, are, you want to find out. And then at the component here, we have three operating facilities there. We have Westerbork, we have Appetit, and have Lufa. If your question is about which of, which of them that your question is about, then you select that one. And then you put whatever question you have here, and then you create, you hit create and then your ticket will come through and we will respond to that. So that is briefly how, uh, briefly about Astron and the LOFA system. Now let's look at the LOFA system in brief. Like I said, I'm trying to present this in a very simple uh, manner. So LOFA, most of the pictures we see about LOFA is this. And let's remember that LOFA is a low frequency array and meaning we are operating at the low frequency. So somewhere in the early part of the blue here, that is where the LOFA telescope is uh, operating. Now, uh, there are a few things that I want to mention. LOFA telescope uh, has, the telescope has antennas that are grounded in different parts of Europe. And I'll mention exactly which country. So if you talk about LOFA telescope, just a set of antennas that are grouped a set of dipole antennas that are grouped. So if you talk about each station, station is just antennas put together. And they are just dipole antennas which are connected with cables and they will have, each of them has a, a station cabinet or station container with electronics and local computing infrastructure that does the music. But important thing I want to mention here is LOFA is operating within the frequency range of 10, and 240 megahertz. I'll mention that LOFA has is using two different types of uh, antennas, which we refer to as the low band antennas and high band antennas, and they are operating at these frequencies. Now, the whole concept of LOFA is that the signal from the station 
goes through a, cor a correlator that is a correlator and beam former for LOFA telescope. And then from there, this correlate put the data together. And then we do a little of uh, processing and it goes into archives. So if you're a user, you only get your data in the archives. And I'll mention that we have three types of archives. We call the archives LOFA uh, long-term archives. So that is where users come for their data. Now, uh, so from these things that I'm saying, you can, you can think of uh, high speed fiber connections that needs to be connected to the different uh, stations to the very central or to the processing center. Like I said, uh, LOFA, is not in any one particular location. The stations are distributed across uh, Europe. And currently we have what we call uh, 52 stations or 53 operational stations. Out of these 52, these 52, 38 of them are in the Netherlands. And those in the Netherlands, we have put them into two. There's a central place here in the Netherlands we call the, the, the very center is the core. So the division, of what is called, what is remote, is how far away the antennas are from the very center of the array. So we have 14 of them that is, are referred to as remote stations and 24 as uh, core stations. Besides, we have another 14 stations that are distributed uh, in Germany, UK, France, Poland, Sweden, Ireland, and currently we have one in Latvia, which has just been commissioned. So in UK, for example, we have one, but in a place like Germany, we have six stations, and in Poland, we have three uh, different stations. Now, I'll, I'll mention that when you are at a LOFA station, we have different configuration, we have different description of the stations. What I mean is here is that LOFA has different antennas. Each station has different antennae. So whatever observation you are doing, depending upon what you want to look at, that you can choose number of stations based on your observation. So we have the very central six, we call them super tapes. The 24 that is within the ESLO, we call them the, uh, the core stations. And those that are far away, but in Netherlands, we call them remote stations. And the 14 that are in other parts of Europe outside the Netherlands are what we call the international stations. And by the end of 2021, we expect to have a new one in, in, uh, in Italy. So now data, data is what these uh, instruments are uh, generating. So there's a huge amount of data that is generated. So just as I've mentioned, the very center, six antennas are referred to, and these antennas, are, they are numbered. So every station has a specific number that we have assigned to the station. For example, the station in UK is UK 608. For the international station, the station names begin with the country name. German, German is DE, UK is UK, Sweden is SE. So just the, the code of the country. So we have the super tab. And then, like I said, we have two types of antennas. We call the uh, high band antennas and the low band antenna. So every station, LOFA station has these two types of antennas, the low band and then the high band. So uh, if the, the whole concept that this, this instrument work on is using interferometry and then what you refer to as a phase array or beam forming. So beam forming techni techniques is what actually is used to bring signal from the different antennas together to point at the sources that uh, we want to uh, look at. So what I want us to note is that uh, the LOFA stations are capable to point and track, have different pointing and tracking capacities or capabilities because of the, the configuration of the antennas. And again, Beam forming is a technique. So beam forming and interferometry are the techniques for using the LOFA to observe. I mentioned two types of antennas, the high band and then the low band. So this is on the, on the immediate 
on the top left, this is how the LBA is, and typical spectral response of the LBA. And then the HBA is also, it's just assembly of what you refer to as ties. They are bow uh, tie sheet uh, dipole uh, antennas that are arranged in four by four grids. So basically that is what the HBA ties are. And if you look, if you talk about each HBA tie, it has 16 of these, which are four, four for each. So the, the whole box here has 16, and that is one tie, one, one tie. And I'll mention that the different antenna stations that we've talked about has, they have different number of HBA tiles. Okay. Uh, so we have three main types of uh, station configurations in terms of the arrangements of the, the HBA and the LBA antennas. We have the, the core station. Every core station has two uh, HBA stations. So in observation, we call one HBA1, HBA0. HBA1, HBA0 for this. Now this is how they are two. And then the, what we see here is also the HBA. And I'll, show, I'll tell you the number of dipoles that are consisted of the stations. And if you look at the remote station, the configuration, configuration is different. We have the same number of, of the same 48 HBA tiles, but they are all at one particular point, point station. And this is also how the, uh, what do you call it, the international stations are. All these are LBA, and we also have 96 uh, HBA stations. So the, the arrangement, or the configuration and even the electronics of the different antenna types are different at the different uh, stations. I mentioned the major uh, station configuration. We have the super tab, the core station, the remote station, the international station, the number of stations. So as I said, if you go to the international stations, we have 96 LBA antennas and 96 HBA tiles but they, it is rather different in the case of uh, the HBA. So for, for the remote stations, we have one HBA, but one stations, 24, 24 tiles. If you go to the remote and the core, we have two HBA stations, but with 24 uh, stations or tiles each. So that is how, and all these things, uh, the, the, the driver, the signs that, uh, these, the sign drivers of this project were used to configure all these uh, stations. Now, I don't want to spend much time on this. This, just to mention the, the signal chain, exactly what happens. We have uh, the local control units, I mean, for each station, we, what, what actually uh, is very important is that we have polyphase uh, filters that are responsible for uh, the beam forming of the, 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 beam for, the beam forms that take place, that take place at the uh, stations. But let me mention that there are some observations that don't need to be recorded at the correlators and things. We call them transient buffer bolt observations. They are using different types of techniques, which I don't want to bother you with. But what is important is that LOFA observations, we have two main sampling uh, clocks for sampling also putting the data together at the different subbands. And we have the 160 and then 20 megahertz clocks. By currently, we are using most of the observation. For example, for the last cycle, we are always use, we are only using the 200 megahertz. Now, just to understand this, the data that come from the observation, uh, from the stations, go to the central processing uh, cluster, and then it comes to the archive, the LTA, and then the user uh, takes it from there. And 
there are different types of observations that we also do. We have beamform, we have interferometry, and there are observations that do both beamform and interferometry or imaging at the same time, in addition to the transient buffer both observations that I've talked about. And like I said here, um, when you observations from the, when data from the stations come to the cobalt, they go to the processing cluster, which we call the set, this is the central processing cluster number four. Now, for most people who don't have the, the data that comes to the, that comes out of the set four is not science ready data. We, we need to do further processing. You may need to do further processing. So if a user doesn't have in-house processing material, there's also a second processor we call separate that you can request to use for your uh, process, data processing needs. And let's as I mentioned, the whole concept of the LOFA is on beam forming. And I don't want to spend much time on here. You can read Ben's paper and then you understand much about this. Now on the beam forming, if you look at the HBA, for example, a single tie can form a beam. And then you can also put all the beam from different sides together and then to form a station beam. The tie array is also beam that are formed that by combining the different antennas together. So all these things are arranged. So what it's telling is that depending upon whatever observation that you are observing, you can do co-observation, you can observe different sources, different spots at the same time, putting each beam at a particular source that you want to uh, do. And when you look at the HPLBA, for example, they look at the entire sky. So in that case, it's also needed to just steer the beam in the direction that you, you want. Now, I quickly want to run through uh, how do people get time to do their, uh, to get the data to do their science. So I'll rush through this quickly, and this is really where I am so much involved in. Remember, every science instrument is built uh, based on a science need. So the main science drivers of uh, the Lufa telescopes has been, uh, what do you call, the deep extragalactic survey, uh, cosmic rays, solar fixes, and space weather, epoch of re, re, you know, re, <coughs> sorry, I didn't take a little. Epoch of reunization, pulses, and then ultra high energy cosmic rays. So these are the driver sciences that inform the construction of the uh, LUFA telescopes. Now, how do I get uh, time to observe my uh, project or my sources? These are, I've just outlined the processes that we go through to get data for your uh, publications. So the first thing is you need to submit the proposal. Proposal is ass uh, assessed. When it is accepted, uh, we'll do the, we plan, we schedule, we observe, and then after the observation, the raw data is pre-processed, and then we check the quality of the data. We report on the what we have seen, and then we get your data ingested into the LTA. Then from there, you state your data, you download it, and then you process it. After that, you can continue with your science. So this is the process that is for. If you have any questions specifically, you can ask, and I'll explain that to you. So LOFA observations are, I'll, I'll say, is uh, cycled. We have two main observing cycles in a year. For example, as we speak now, we are observing cycle 14. And then the cycle 15 proposal call came out on the 10th of July. And the proposal de deadline was uh, 9th September. So currently we are assessing the proposals and by the second week of November, the results will be out and then we let the PIs know. And I want to mention that we have three types of proposals that we take. We have the normal proposals, which can be a single cycle or long-term cycle. And then we have the DDT and then commissioning. Anytime there's a call for proposal, 
we are only referring to the normal cycle proposal. If you have something that you want to test, that is a commissioning. You can submit commissioning proposal at every time, every point during the, uh, the cycle. And then the DDT is also just like that. If there's something that you want to and you don't have time to wait for the next cycle and has scientific value per the instrument, you can also submit that. So that is it. And like I said, we have two proposals. Co proposals go out twice uh, a year. Normally, the first one go out in July. Like I said, this year, uh, cycle 15 went July 10th. And then the deadline was in, is always in September. The next call is in January. And the deadline is in March. So the first observing cycle for a year is December to May. And then the next one is so these are the times that we observe. Anytime there's a call for proposal, we specify, we publish this in all our media networks. And then we also mentioned it's during uh, our bi-monthly meetings, we call LOFA status meeting. And then we mentioned that in the LOFA newsletters. And in these uh, notices, we mentioned the observing hours that will be available for the cycle, the available uh, time slots. I mean, the LST pressure, uh, pressure plus or regions that you can, uh, you can observe. We also mentioned the processing hours that we will have for the cycle, how much data we can get or we can store. And then not only that, we also mentioned the capabilities and then the guidelines that you can use to uh, submit your proposal. And proposals are submitted online using the NOSTA online tool. So if you want to understand more about this, uh, please, I have documented, especially the LOFA uh, frequently asked questions, I've documented everything that you need to find out. And much of such are also, also found at the LOFA slide of uh, uh, web page. So not to bother you so much, after the technical review, uh, we'd go through different stages. For the first one, we check, the proposals are okay. We do we go, we go through technical uh, review, then final assessment by the pro program committee. If your proposal is accepted, then it goes into the schedule as I mentioned earlier. For now, what we do is proposals are prioritized as A or B, priority A project or priority B. So that is based on the science merits and your proposal. So we go through these stages, like I just mentioned to get your proposals, uh, accepted proposals, uh, uh, prepared, I mean, the project prepared, and then we check your report and then we, we get you. This is uh, a typical observing schedule for LUFA, and this was the schedule for last, last week. Anytime you want to check or you have any, when you, you check, if you look at the, the link here, it will put, L. So LC14 means that this is the observing cycle 14. So what, when, whatever cycle we want to check the schedule, you put the number here. And on the next, you, you get that. Now, this is a simple or a typical uh, uh, observing schedule that we have. After the proposals have been accepted and we plan and we schedule them based on whatever, let's see, whatever time you want to observe, this is how, what we do. Now, the colors you have here are what you call the uh, friends of the project. So my color is green. So it means that every, every, every project that is green, I make sure it is scheduled, I prepare the observations, I put it uh, in, uh, to, to, I let them run. After that, I report to the PI and tell them what the quality of the data is. And then I also send the data into the archive. If the PI has any question, any concern, I'm the one the PI talks to. I'm also the Marco is supposed to be the, the PR, the friend of this project, but he's a bit, very busy. So I'm also taking care of this. So this is how. So on this, like I said, we also have the software support people here. We have the system administrators here. We have the observers here who do the scheduling of the project. So like I said, it's not one person doing everything. And we even have those people on the field. If you look at a simple, uh, simple uh, antenna, that antenna is like that, those of LUFA, there are a lot of things to do in terms of maintenance. So this is what, what goes in during the sample. Now, when we are also observing, there's, there's a lot of control and monitoring, 
my monitoring stuff that we do. So we make sure that everything goes well. A lot of tools that we use to do that. And when we are done and the data uh, right after observation, there are a lot of checks that we need to do to find out. So after every observation, we have a lot of plots, a lot of uh, things that are generated, which we use to assess the quality of the data. And if the data is okay, then we ingest it into the uh, LTA for the PI. This is a simple, uh, again, scenario uh, of the LOFA system. Just as I mentioned, the data from the station with all the combination of the signals and things like that, it goes to the processing, uh, what do you call it? The, the cobalt, the co correlator and beam former for cobalt, uh, for LOFA. And then it comes to where we actually do what we call pre-processing. And from here, if after there, if you, the, uh, the user has not requested for further processing access, or you don't, you, have, you don't have, you have, what do you call it? You can do your own processing, -process, post-processing, then you just come here, and then you, the, the data goes into the LTA. But those who don't have further processing devices, then they request to use our other cluster for their data uh, processing. So now we've, we have done the observations, we have data, we've checked the quality, uh, we've put them in the LTA. So the interaction, like, as I mentioned, the only place that the PI gets the, the data is to go to the LTA. So I have put also here documents on how you can go to the LTA and then you download your data. First, the data goes to the, to a, to the disk in the LTA and then it goes to tapes. So first you need to stage the data from the, the, the tapes to the disk and then you download. So we do staging and then downloading of the data. And like I said, if you have any question, you are, you are always encouraged to uh, contact us. And uh, we have a lot of uh, slides information on how to do all these things. And I importantly, when it comes to data handling and processing, we've also, we also have two important uh, uh, imaging, two uh, cookbooks, one for imaging observation, that is the interferometry and one for beam form uh, observation. So even if you're a starter, you can go through this and you start doing your own thing. An important thing that I need to mention that there's a lot of data in the archives and uh, when you are, you, you know how to do it, you can have uh, a lot of data to work on. And uh, let me also mention that uh, for the 10 years of LOFA, there has been a lot of publication in the different science uh, cases, science areas. And as of the end of, of the first quarter, we have over 200 uh, papers that have been submitted that used uh, LOFA data. And of those, more than 5,000 uh, completed citations of these uh, papers. Now, let me also mention that, uh, like I said, LOFA is into computing, is into receiver development, is into APC, is into LOFA, is into, I mean, Astron, sorry, is into Westerbork, Appetit, and even. So sometimes the question is, how do people get uh, in, especially for some of us, uh, in the DARA, uh, we are just done, we are, or we are doing a project, how do we get involved in some of these things? Now, let me mention that anytime you, you, you want to, I mean, if you're interested in things here, you always look for information about uh, programs and meetings that are happening. And here are some of the things that Astron is organizing, which you can, you, you can apply to the parts and who knows what you can earn from there. So you have LOFA school that is conducted uh, twice, once every two years. In fact, the one was, the last one was supposed to be, uh, to be this year, but because of the situation, we have moved it to, we have moved it forward, I'll mention that. And we have traineeship, we have, apart from traineeship, we have recess summer schools, and most of the people working here are also affiliated to universities. So most of them do course provisions of PhD and master's program. And there are also special programs for females 
uh, who want to visit and do something. Again, if it's about job, most of them are advertised at AAS Job Register. And we also have, I've also put here the link to our strong webpage where job opportunities are, are advertised. So these uh, friends, uh, Alex and co, uh, were part of the summer research program that is organized by Astron and Jive. I'll mention that. So an immediate meeting of some of the things you can put in is if you register or if you subscribe to the Astron mailing list, you always be informed about meetings. For example, on every second week of every second Wednesday of every month, there's a meeting we call Lufa Status Meeting, which normally happens around two to three, between two to three uh, Central European time. So if you are a member of the Astrom uh, community. I mean, if you have subscribed to the Astrom mailing list, you always receive information about uh, that. Yeah, so I mentioned the task school. The one for this year has been postponed and the anticipated date is uh, next year, March. Now we are still looking at whether we will, it will be online or we will come in person to uh, the Anglo Astrom. Depends on the situation at the time. In addition, there's also a traineeship program called Astron Jive Traineeship in Science Operation and with Massive Area Program. Actually, this is my entry point. I and uh, Bing Pong were the first people who benefited from this in 2018. So we're the first trainees on this project. And after I was done, I had the opportunity to come back and I'm still here now. I don't know where I'm living anyway. So that is also one sure way to, to, to get into the system. But again, as I said, uh, if you want to be part of the LOFA mailing list, please send an email to my immediate boss, uh, Roberto, and he will add you, and then you will receive subsequent emails and uh, emails on programs and projects and an important announcements pertaining getting into a strong end. Let me also mention that uh, Aston is in the same building here in Dwingolo with two other powerful organizations. The Jive, we've, we've heard so much about, that is involved in the EVN observations, I mean, coordinating the EVN observation. And then there's also one known as NOVA, Netherlands Research School for uh, Astronomy. And they are into development of all sorts of uh, instruments for you can see a lot of the instruments that they have, I mean, the telescopes or the system that they have built things for. So these are also things, opportunities that you can support uh, when you are terrorists like myself. Now, to conclude, uh, let me mention a few things about LOFA. I was just talking to Melvin about what we call the LOFA 2. Currently, what we are operating is referred to as LOFA 1. I'm not surprised we've moved from Astron 1 to Astron 2, so we can also move to <laughs> Lufa 2. So not to bore you much about this, all that we are trying to do is we are trying to improve the operational, uh, to how we can maximize the use of the telescope. So we are going to do a lot of, uh, add a lot of things. And a project like Duplo is just improving the LDA, part of observation. And I just read that they got two, uh, 3.5 million uh, euro uh, for this particular upgrade. So currently, Astron can, uh, LOFA can observe only either in the LBA or in the HBA, based on your observation, whatever you're observing. But with the Duplo, with the second phase of LOFA, LOFA 2, we want to have a system where you can observe simultaneously with both the LBA and the HBA. And then one other thing that we want to do, a lot of manual work, and then we will try to automate a lot of the workflow. That will be part of the second phase of Astron. And an important thing is the coming into effect of the SDC, the Science Data Center. What we plan to do is we put a lot of processing in the LTA so that users will not get pre-processed data, but will get science-ready data. We refer to that L2 L, uh, data product. Now we are generating L1 and L0 data products. So that is what the uh, LOFA 2 is all about. And then lastly, I'll put in here the summary that I put on the, on the abstracts. But what I need to mention here is that uh, if you want to understand more about the LOFA system and it's whatever, please, 
refer to these uh, links. Remember also to find, if, you, if we can find every information you need about Astrom or most of the things in these links that are provided. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to end it up here and uh, for the sake of time. So thank you very much for listening to me. Hello. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Bernard, for um, really giving us a good tour of uh, what LOFAR is and uh, how things operate, you know, especially from your, your position there as, as a sort of support scientist and, um, you know, pointing the way to the future uh, and, uh, and showing how people can get involved. I mean, uh, it's also true that Astron has supported a lot of DARA people uh, over the years, as you mentioned, uh, with you and Emmanuel going there, but uh, Benedicta has also been to Astron uh, from Ghana and benefited from some training there. So um, they they do a good service. And uh, I know uh, uh, Carol, who is in charge there now, is, is is very keen to sort of push push those things forward as well. And, uh, and uh, I think she's very involved in uh, the EU Africa initiative in terms of uh, trying to get EU funding to help uh, radio, develop radio astronomy uh, in, in Africa as well uh, and associated fields. So um, Astron is certainly a, an excellent, an excellent uh, institution. Okay, we've got plenty of questions in the bank. Um, so let me... Uh, Solomon was first up with these. So, um, Solomon, I guess you probably want to combine your first and second questions, perhaps. So, I'll, uh, I think you can talk now. All right. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yep. I hear you. Yes. All right. So, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, I think I enjoyed it. Um, while um, I was hoping there will be a little talk on um, how Lofa in is involved in, let's say, uh, specific research, uh, because I'm particularly um, interested in how LOFA can be used to explore galactic magnetic fields. Um, I think um, it was not really a lecture to really um, um, dive into um, those specifics. However, that was my first question. Um, the second one is, um, it's a little bit confused, I, I mean, confusion or I'm confused about. Um, so I know um, if you want to decide on what to observe, it's usually based on the um, baseline um, of the LOFA antennas that you want to use. However, I think in the lecture you might have mentioned um, um, something about the stations, which is the core, the core ones and then the remote ones, and also um, um, with them, I mean, in terms of how they can be used in observation. So I'm a little bit confused. I don't know if you get that question as well. Uh. So your first question is, you want to find out, uh, so, so how um, LOFA can be used in exploring uh, magnetic fields in the galactic medium, say, because I know um, it works in the low frequency, so I think it would be helpful, but I just wanted to know more information about how it could be done. Yeah, yeah so that is exactly what I mentioned from uh, I mentioned, I talked about the different science, uh, science cases that are done here, right? And then uh, I've also on, in the frequently asked questions, I've also put links to all the researches that have been done using data from, from the low fat telescope, but I don't understand what your question, do you want to find out which data you can use or whether you can use it to observe something in that respect? Yeah, so I know LOFA is very useful for low frequencies. That and exactly, it, yes. Yeah, and in terms of magnetic fields, I know um, the electrons that are able to permit, um, I mean, with those real particles to help detect these magnetic fields can be explored I think properly with low fat because it's in low frequencies. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to know if you could mention a specific research which might have been done and how it was done, something like that. 
there are a lot of researches that are done. You mentioned what uh, cosmic, uh, sorry. Uh, so if you look at the, 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 what I've put on the slide now, you can see the different science fields, science areas that we have papers, that papers have been altered in the field. Like I said, I have, I'm not, this is not a science talk. I just want to yeah. tell you what has been done or what you can do with. And I can say that for what you said, yes, magnetism, there are a lot of papers, for example, for, we have 12 papers that are written in magnetism. And if you want more information, I can also point you to people who are doing those uh, research in those fields. So that if you want collaboration or you want somebody to work with or somebody to show you something in the field, uh, you can also, I can also direct you. But let me tell you, for now, my science interest is in AGN and in, uh, what do you call it? And in galaxy images. So I'm not doing anything Cosmic uh, okay. degree. Okay, okay, great. Actually, I meant to tell, let me tell you that picture. people are doing that, and there's data. Surely, this is uh, the instrument to do science in that field. Okay, so great. I don't know whether you want uh, to know who is doing it or you want to do it yourself. No, 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 it's okay. I think you have explained them properly, yeah. and I think I would also go on and read them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, well, Bernard, do you want to take Solomon's question about, you know, the, how you, I think it's really how you would choose between whether you only observe with the core or whether you use remote or whether you use the international stations? Or... Yes. So, uh, I don't know exactly what you, you, you want to find out about, but the point is depends on what targets you are looking at and what science you want to do. Like that, what baseline you want or the type of uh, uh, sensitivity or whatever. Remember in one of the stripes, I showed you the baselines and the sensitivities are the different. Uh, yeah. So, so it depends. For example, if you are observing poses, most of the pose observation, they only use the, what do you call it? Uh, the core stage, the super tapes. Some of the things you, you, you use the super tapes. But if you want to get, you want a, a longer baseline, then definitely you include the international stations. So it depends on what science you want to do and the type of the, the sensitivity, the resolution that you want. Yeah, if you want sub arc second oh, okay. resolution, you need the uh, international baselines, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it depends on what you want to look at, okay. yeah, what baseline you need for the patient. Otherwise, you get, okay. yeah, like four or five arc second resolution, I guess, is the, the if you yes. just use the Dutch ones, I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, so great. Actually, Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Solomon. That's good questions. I think um, Emmanuel has his own question, but I think he might also be able to uh, address your other question, Solomon, about uh, loads of radio galaxies and using LOFAR to investigate the magnetic fields, because that's exactly what he's doing for his research. So. Uh, uh, let, let me allow Emmanuel to talk. Emmanuel, you might want to address that as well as asking your own question, perhaps. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, um, Bernard, for such a nice talk. And um, actually, oh, okay, well, let me just uh, quickly uh, talk about the magnetism thing, uh, just uh, a little bit before I come to the question. So, um, with with LOFA, uh, using LOFA to prove a uh, magnetic field is really uh, an interesting or a groundbreaking uh, area as far as the instrument capability is concerned. Uh, because uh, obviously at low frequencies, you expect to find that when you are observing in the radio regime, there's this ionospheric uh, distortion where it is really difficult to have um, very, I would say, decent observations of your targets, your science targets. And when you take the sensitivity of the instrument also into consideration, because LOFA is very sensitive, then it even gets worse. But there, there's always a workaround. So uh, we go beyond just doing the 
traditional polarization observation to what we call the Faraday rotation uh, synthesis uh, technique, where we are able to isolate the range in Faraday space and map out the magnetic fields uh, in our line of sight as uh, we point our telescope or uh, yeah, instrument to the science target. So it's, it's doable and doing it even at low frequencies makes it more interesting, challenging, but also very uh, in, in interesting in its own right. Yeah, uh, I don't know if maybe the, that uh, is enough, but probably I'll just stop here and then move on to my question, which is quite a, a very simple one. Uh, Bernard, I, I wanted to know with, with the restructuring, yes. um, currently there's the science group in Astron, like uh, the group dedicated to- uh, Astronomy group. Yes, yeah, yeah, astronomy group, yeah, doing science and publications and stuff like that, like uh, focus on research only. Uh, mm -hmm. But with the restructuring, I did not find any, I, I, I saw something like science data center, which will be more geared towards data science stuff, but not like the real astronomy research. Is, is, is the group dissolved or <laughs> it's maybe... Yeah, yeah. So, thank you. So what is happening now is, uh, so those, all those people are, we have what you call the, let me go, the focus group. Right. The focus group, we have the advanced algorithm, we have the gigahertz, lofa imaging, uh, to beam form, and then the SDC. So these one, two, three, four, five, they are where that we have the former astronomy group members. So what you are going to do now is, uh, if you are in the old astronomy group, you, you are also attached to a focus group. So in addition to your science, you do support of the system in one way or the other. Okay. For example, uh, uh, Tim Shimwell, remember yeah. he has been doing only the science, but yes. now he is supporting, we are enrolling uh, the White Rabbit project. Savage has left, so he is taking care of the White Rabbit project rollout. Okay. And in the same way, even now we don't have the system administration uh, group, they are now part of the ICT. Okay. Yeah, but what we do is that with all these, for example, for us in the uh, TO, Telescope Operation and SDC, if you need the service of anybody from any other place, we write internal SLA yeah. with, that, with that group so that the person will be in that group but will be working for other persons or on other projects. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they still do their, uh, their research, but not purely research as it's used to now. If you look at the gigahertz platform, for example, Morganti is in charge of that, is the head of that. I didn't want to show the details of it because it's new and nobody's presenting and showing people's name. That's why I didn't show that. Okay, all right. All right. If you click on it, everybody's name is there. They show what everybody's doing. But now currently, for example, for the TO, I'm trying to, uh, for the TO we have, different groups, we have the maintenance, we have the soft, uh, maintenance, the software, and then the operation. So I had the operation unit. So I'm developing a, a, a SLA with the other people, Marco and Sander, who needs to come and work for, for the scheduling and other things. Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. I'm sure you're wondering if there's still a job opportunity at uh, Astron. <laughs> yeah, you, you should talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks for addressing Solomon's question. I mean, I think also to follow up on Solomon, then yeah, there is a lot of work to be done on galactic magnetic fields using the similar techniques, I think, that um, uh, Emmanuel talked about. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in that, but yeah, the whole rotation measure synthesis type thing. You've got a lot of diffuse sources in the galactic plane and you can do some quite sophisticated analysis there looking at the, the foreground magnetic fields and that kind of thing. So there are people working on that. Yeah, yeah it's on quite large scale though. So. I think at another time I can talk about the science, the science, uh, this one, I just wanted to give a general overview. So at another yeah. time, maybe I'll, talk, I'll take one aspect and then I will look at that. Absolutely, it's a whole different talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I see a couple of people who've raised hands, uh, Ruby and uh, Sigrid. I mean, if you, can, if you can type your question in the Q&A box instead, then that would be good. Mm -hmm. um, I also see Calvin's has a question that just has question, question mark. So maybe, <laughs> maybe let me know what your question really is and we'll get to you later. 
Um, next up, uh, let's go to Yara, who has a, a very nice question on the frequency range. So, uh, Yara, do you want to come on? Mm. You should be able to unmute yourself, uh, Yara. Mm. I don't know how good your connection is. If not, I can ask on your behalf. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, we can hear you now, yep. Yes, my question is about the range of frequencies. While you were talking, you show us that the low band um, antenna operates from 10 to 90 megahertz and the high band antenna from 110 to 240 megahertz. And what about the, the um, frequency that is out from 90 to 110 megahertz? Yeah, so I, I thank know you. I'm lost. And so uh, if you look between, if you go beyond 90 to to 110, that is where the commercial FM stations are operating. So uh, our filter, even for these ranges that I've said, we have uh, filters in these bands. For example, for the LBA, we have a filter from, the, the, even the LBA is maximized between 30 and 80, right? And even within that, uh, we have filters. For example, if, uh, we have filters from nine, uh, one, 30 to 90. And then if you look at the HBA2, we have 110 to, so we have different filters within this region. But your question, the, the issue with between 90 and 110 is the problem we have with the FM, the uh, commercial FM stations. So that, uh, that uh, frequency is very, it's not very clean for, 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 for use and for astronomy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Yara. Very good question. And uh, I mean, it, there's a more general point that, you know, a lot of people were skeptical in the, in the first place because building low far in the middle of Europe is uh, the worst place in the world, really, for RFI. You know, it's the exact opposite of going to the SKA sites and, and building the telescopes in remote locations. But, you know, you, you certainly demonstrate that you can do science e even in the teeth of all that RFI. I don't know if you want to comment, Bernard. But... Yes, uh, so uh, if you go to the field, which I've gotten the chance to, uh, I mean, I did one with uh, Emmanuel when we were here. Uh, most of the buildings or the apart, the square the species are, are a bit away from human settlements. But that, given that, we still have problem with RFI. If we go to a station like uh, 407, 406 and 409, we know that these are the issues there. For example, call station 103, we know that this is the issue there. So sometimes the proposer will know how to filter their data against such interference. And sometimes to the maintenance team have to go to, we, we do RFI mitigating, mitigation uh, observations. So if we see particular observations, uh, interference coming from a particular, we can go there. I remember there are a couple of times that we have to go and change people's houses lights for them because they are using light that are impeding on observations. So RFI is yes, but we try as much as possible to minimize the effect on observations. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, next up is, uh... Patrick, who's also looking for a job, I think, from, the, <laughs> from his question. So Patrick, do you want to ask your question? Okay, good, good evening. Good evening. Go ahead. We can hear you, Patrick. You want to ask your question, Patrick? My question is about. Uh, uh, hold on, Patrick. Your your connection. Uh, I, I, 
Just like Melvin introduced me at that point, I had been working with the AVN the Ghana Telescope and things like that. So in 2018, Astron Dive started a traineeship program, which is a science uh, traineeship in science operations with Massive Array, which we all applied. So luckily, I and uh, Emmanuel got the opportunity to be here. So we we're taken through a 12 week, a 12 week program. And before we finish, uh, by that time, some of the staff at the science operations and support group, which are in charge of uh, running the operations, had their contracts finished and they were leaving. And then one lady also had to go on maternity leave. So before we left, my media boss called me and said, if I can come and help. Because when we went, uh, Emmanuel will uh, tell you that we didn't joke, we tried to understand the system. So when they realized that we have no and little, and by the Emmanuel was also going to school, they said, okay, he asked me if I can come. So I came for six months. And after six months, they asked me if I can stay again for another six months. Then I did. And then again, they said, if I can stay for the other one, and I said yes, and then they did. So it's dedication to what you do and putting all your energy, I mean, doing something and doing it well, that is what always pays. So I got the opportunity to get the training I got the opportunity to work and I worked well, so they realized that I am needed. I am not surprised. Yesterday, they, uh, they asked me to put some things down. If you check the web page, they just put this. I was even surprised this morning. And then my boss called me and I said, Bernard, you're becoming popular. I said, oh, no. <laughs> so that is how uh, it, it happened. I worked when I got the opportunity, and then when the opportunity came, they called me. Yep, hard work never does anyone any harm. So, yeah, thanks, uh, Emmanuel. You have a uh, proven. Sorry, you have a couple of questions. Yeah. Trying to unmute you. Uh, I don't know what's happening. It's gone a bit slow. How does that not work? Uh, I seem to have lost control of the. Uh, Things. I don't know why it's not letting me be allowed. To, the allowed to talk button has stopped working. I'll have to ask it for you. I'm afraid, uh, Proven. Um, um, <clears throat> so Proven's asking what network switches you have that can handle 150 gigabytes a second, <laughs> uh, and wondering about the GRAO uh, sort of equipment uh, and also the sort of substation system in, in re reference to the RFI. I don't know, maybe you can read the questions as well there, Bernard, uh, on the uh, Q&A. Uh, let me see. Yeah, Bernard, you're muted. Okay. If you just click on the Q&A box. Okay. I'll try again with the... I don't have... Oh, okay. Well, go for the first question, which was, uh, you know, what kind of network switches can handle 150 gigabytes a second? <laughs> uh, networks to handle... So you mean it's too huge to be handled? Or what do you well, mean? I, well, I guess that's the question. Yeah. Well, you've got very significant data rates, right? So yeah, I presume you've got fairly cutting-edge hardware to handle it. Of course, they do have. Yeah. Yes. Um, so he was also asking about, uh, I think we may have lost him actually. Uh, I think he's disconnected. Um, if it's possible to have a substation system similar at GRAO considering our RFI issues, I'm thinking of having... I think so it, will be, it will be hell. 
Yeah. But even if you look at the situation here, where stations are and where human beings are staying, and we still have to deal with RFI and other issues, uh, it will be difficult. Yeah. So I guess maybe he's really asking, is it, is it stupid to have a low fast station in Ghana to study solar and space weather? Actually, that's the real question I think I now interpret. Yeah. Yeah, so one thing that we also need to do is we don't have to have LUFA in Ghana to do space weather studies. For example, uh, Pietro is heading a lot of, one of my colleagues is heading a lot of, he is PI of this. So like I told you the other time, I'm going to work with him after a lot of pressure is pushed off me. So you just need collaboration. And like I said, if I pointed out to, we have over 50, petabyte of data sitting in the archives. And I didn't go there. Uh, one thing, when you observe, you have, you have proprietary for one year. After one year, anybody else can use the data. Besides, if there's a data and you know the PI, and the PI allows, you can use it. So that we don't have to have the LUFA there. We only need to connect, and then you have access to the data, and then you, you do your space weather or whatever research you want to do. Sure. I know. I mean, in the UK, I think the, I think the solar group or maybe the solar and space weather people are using a, a, sto a station as standalone instrument um, yes. to monitor because you don't need such high resolution. So th there's also that aspect that, you know, you can yeah, use a station I'm, as a standalone instrument. Yeah. And, you know, maybe having one in Africa is not such a bad idea, but then they do cost quite a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Stephen, do you want to go? Let's try. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Stephen, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, please, can you hear me? Yes. Sure. Thank, you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, nice talk, Doctor. I understand per the station configurations, antennas, cluster are either separated or compacted. I wanted to know the engineering factor behind this. Thank you. The, the way the I mean the way the antennas are arranged. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I don't know so much about the configuration, but what I know is uh, the, the antennas were designed, designed, built, and been operated by Astro. So remember, I've been here not too long ago, so it's not everything that I know, but I know it was designed based on the science drivers. I don't know exactly how, what they took into account. So I haven't uh, read that. But like I said, if you look at the paper by... Uh, Haram, everything is specified in the on the reference pages in the reference page that I get to. Seven. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously the the HBA ones are packed in very closely together, like all the tiles are next to each other, whereas the LBA ones are sort of more spread out. I think. Uh, yes. I'm not sure the reason myself, I don't Yes, know. okay, it, it's all, it depends on the baseline that, remember in one of the slides, I showed the separation between the antennas. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, personally also, I haven't looked at that, but uh, what I understand is, is based on the distance, even this is the diameter of the international station, and it's the same for all international stations, and it's different from uh, the, uh, this. If you even look at uh, one station in Poland, it only has one, it's international station in Poland, but it doesn't have, it has only one uh, 48 uh, HBA tiles, not 98 HBA tiles, not 96 HBA tiles. So I don't know exactly what informed the choices of those things, but I understand it's based on the science, the initial science needs of the project. Okay, uh, a similar question next from, uh... Danelza, Danelza, do you want to ask your question? Hello. Hi. Hi, Bernard. Hi. Thank you for the good talk about- Hey, that's my friend. 
<laughs> yes, I miss you. I miss you too. I remember Japan. Sorry? I remember Japan. Yeah, also in Me Mexico. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Ah, Melvin took his day. <laughs> yes, yes, he took. Okay. Uh, I have here three questions. Okay. And um, two are related with the stations, okay? All right. Um, I would like to know how many antennas uh, each station has. And uh, another is about the time that it takes to get the LOFA station ready. Okay. 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 And the third one is about uh, the data. Av av is it uh, avail availability? Like uh, when someone uh, has uh, a time to observe, then uh, after time, you turn the data public or no? Yeah, okay, so let me start from the last question. So when you observe, there are three data sets that we have. Okay. We have the commissioning data, which you, you don't go for, we don't give it out okay. for development. And then we have long-term projects. Okay. So lo the long-term projects are continuing projects. So it's run for almost two years. So okay. after two years, we have another period before you can take the data. But otherwise, for single cycle projects, after one year, it goes public. So okay. when you go into the LTA, we have data that is public already, and data that is, we've shown all the dates there. Okay. If you click on the LTA side that I, I, the link I embedded in there, you see which okay. data is public and which data is not public. But uh, we have a lot of data public. And I mentioned again that if there's data that's still not public and you need it, just look at the PI, but you can send a request to us through the help desk and our contacts, most of the time I receive uh, these uh, requests. If I can respond, I respond. If I can't, I will send it to whoever can do it better. And then we get the data for you. And then for the station that you mentioned, I think the slide here is telling you. Now, when we look at the super tab, we have six stations in all. Okay. And of the six stations, we have, so SuperTab is a call, call station. So we have 96 LBA antennas and two uh, HBA antennas. I mean, the, each HBA antenna here is 24 tiles. And a tile is 16 uh, dipole elements put four four. So we have two HBA stations. Each is 24 tiles okay. for the four stations. And when you come to the remote stations, we have 96 LBA and 48 uh, HBA. But the HBA is one station. Okay, Most okay. And then when you go to the international stations, apart from PL611, one of the police stations, we have 96 HBA and 96 LBA. Okay. So that, that is the number. And I've also put here the diameter of the respective uh, stations, I mean, from the stretch. And again, when you're observing, there are different modes of observation. There are observations that you can use the outer. For example, we can use, you say HBA outer. It is the outer 48 antennas. And then we say LBA inner, we use the inner 48, uh, what do you call it, uh, antennas. Mm, okay. yeah. So we have different okay. configurations that we can use, pass, pass, lay. So uh, depends on what you want to do, please. Okay, 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 okay. thank you. Thanks, Denosa. Um, we're coming up to uh, we're coming up to the nominal end of time, but um, hopefully if we can keep going and it won't just cut us off. So we've got a few more questions still to go. Uh, next up, Calvitz. Uh, do you want to ask your question, Calvitz? You should be able to unmute now, Calvitz. Hello? Yeah, hi, we can hear you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Bernard, for your talk. 
Thank you, uh, Kevin. Yes, so, you know, uh, I, my first question was about the telescope. I see you talked about the remote telescope. So in some areas, like the countries where you have no stations, can we be able to use this telescope remotely? That means I have a student and then we do an observation, we get the data and then we analyze it. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. So one thing you can do is subscribe to the LOFA uh, newsletter, uh, the LOFA uh, mailing list, so yes. that during the next proposal call, which will be somewhere in, uh, in March, yes. Then the we in Japan that in March, then you can get you apply for this thing. So when you do and you get the you get the time and they observe for you, there are two things. They will do the pre-processing. And then if you don't have even computers that you can, you only need to have internet access. You can use the SEP3 to do the further processing. Yes. And for the further for SEP3, for example, uh, if you don't first we'll give you eight weeks. After eight weeks, if you've still not finished, we'll give you another ACE. And that has all the powers that you need to process your data. But going forward, like I said, for LUFA 2, we are going to have uh, more, could do more processing of the data before it comes to you, the, the user. So yes, you can apply for time and observe. And as I said, even if the data set you see, you want and it's, pu it's public, all you need to do is you tell us that you want to download later now, one thing is everybody can go to L LTA and see whatever is there. But to be able to stage and download data, you need permission from us. So when you register, you create the LOFA accounts and register and tell me you want to tell Aston that you want to download data, if it's public, then we'll give you access permission on your accounts. So that without permission, when you go there, you'll be able to download, stage and download the data. So you can't just go and download data. You first need to ask for permission. We'll give you before you can do that. But everybody can, anybody can see whatever is there. And you can see the proprietary day when it goes public, what is not public yet. Okay, so is this data, the final data from the LOFA telescope, is it uh, calibrated already or we need some softwares to do the calibration after we have downloaded the data? Yes, uh, we have, they are partly, partially, partly calibrated, but if you also go to the cookbooks that I showed you, I pointed to you, yes, we yes. have every step that you need to follow to do whatever you need to do in processing the data. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. But all, yeah, but all just following up that, Calvin's then you know there is also quite a lot of survey data that has been processed, you know, through to full imaging data products, basically. And um, I mean, it's something I've started looking into, and it's probably could be of relevance for the kind of you know master's project that we're shaping up for you there in Kenya as well. I mean, obviously, yes. you know, we're going to look at the Meerkat Galactic Plane yeah. Survey data, but some of the big LOFAR surveys have also covered some of the galactic plane as well. Um, the LOTS project. The LOTS project, yeah. So I've, been, I've sort of started exploring a little bit of that in the past. Um, you know, more data is becoming available all the time. And um, so that, you know, that could be another angle. Uh, and it's much easier, I think, uh, to get into, you know, it, at a, as an entry level, it's probably good to go and look at a look at some survey data that's already been you know, processed by the experts, because it, it's still fair to say that LOFAR data is not that easy to, to handle and calibrate. I, I think everyone would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, so um, it's certainly not where you want to start. And it, and it, and it is, it, you can't process it with CASA usually either. It's, it's got its own software and stuff. So. Yeah, so we we'll guide you on how to install which software. Everything is at the, inside the cookbooks. And then sometimes, so if you have a peculiar interest in doing something, you can always write to whoever you want to talk to. Sometimes people get opportunity to come and work with, work on their data here. I think Jive, especially if you are using EVLI or uh, VLBI data, you can always talk to people and see if you can come and do it here. In case you don't, you might want, to, you want somebody to sit by you to do it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not something you'd want to try <laughs> try by yourself. <laughs> it's pretty complicated. Yeah. yeah, 
but uh, I mean, Astron do support people well. So yeah. it's certainly something to think about. And, uh, you know, we're trying to get into that as we find more non-thermal sources in the galactic plane. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's, yeah. it's a nice project. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Carvins. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, our final question tonight comes from Sigrid. Um, well, Sigrid's got several questions. So Sigrid, do you want to ask some of your questions? You should be able to unmute now. Okay. Thank you, Doctor, for your, um, you call it simple later presentation. Um, that was very great. Um, um, I think I'm starting to pick up a lot as well. But however, I think I was more prepared for more kind of um, Solomon kind of questions, technical questions, or I don't know how to. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first question, I just wanted to find out how quick are the data anal an analyzed? And then... Um, the second question, um, what are the most outstanding advantages? Um, I, actually, I think I meant to say disadvantage. Sorry, I just typed this out quickly. What are the most outstanding or the major um, disadvantage using LOFA than high frequency arrays? And then I have a third question. Um, what are the major difficulties of um, that LOFA have actually encountered and how do you overcome them or currently are overcoming, overcoming them? And um, would, would perhaps high frequency array be a solution to, to that problem or perhaps the hard way? Um, that's, that's, that's a few questions I have for now. Okay. So as to how quick you can analyze data, I think it depends on uh, how much you understand mm -hmm. your tools of analyzing the data. And then how the power of your processing instrument, I mean, your computer or whatever it is. Because if you understand, you know what you are doing, then definitely you go faster. And then if you have the tools to work on your, your data, because one thing is after the observation, the data goes to the archives and you stage and download it, it is you. So how far you analyze depends on you. Yes, that depends on the computing power that you are using and okay. how much time you have and how you understand the processes involved in getting your, your final uh, results. And then if, if, you, if I show some other slides when I talk on something on maintenance, Mm -hmm. There are a lot of, uh, I said, LUFA stations have uh, computing facilities. Sometimes they have water and rodents in the, especially in the HPA types. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you go and some rodents will cut some of the cables and things like that. So uh, especially from uh, April to October is maintenance period. And if you see the way the stations are, we also do a lot of mowing. Uh, okay. And so maintenance is, so for example, in our group, our new group, telescope operations, we have the maintenance, we have the systems, we have, so the maintenance people are in the field all the time, apart from the very worst weather, that they can't stand the weather. Uh, so they do a lot of, and then uh, dipole antennas are just computer antennas. Okay. If I should, because the techniques of beam forming and system is all money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you have the money and you can buy the pass and replace, yes, that's one thing. And then you also need people with, for example, I'm working with people, some of them have worked here for 35 years, 20 years. They understand what they are doing. So we need people with expertise in what they do. So the challenges is that you need people who, most of the people here build a strong uh, loafer right from the scratch. So they understand. So if you are building it and you don't understand it better, uh, for example, uh, three days ago, we had a problem and for almost 18 hours, we couldn't observe. One maintenance guy came, he went to running run where our central process machine is and then the next time we are observing. So the skills and the tech, uh, people is very important in this. So these are some of the difficulties we, we face. And one good thing is we have the people who have learned, who know, and this is not done by one person. You can have somebody at a different end and he doesn't know what is happening at the other end. That's why we mm. work together all the time. 
So if I have answered your questions, the advantage, and then the advantage of using LOFA data against the other high frequency, it depends on what signs you want to and what things you want to cross check. So sometimes you will observe in the high bands and you want to verify or check it in the lower bands. And if you are doing something spectra, you also, or SED, you want to also look at the other uh, frequency band and see what you see there. So it depends on your science interest and your science goals. But sometimes multiple do combine the high and the low to make good sense of what they are studying. Okay. I know Emmanuel have mentioned that iron sphere is one of the difficulties in order for you guys to actually um, do your observations. So um, how do we, how do you actually overcome that? How do you compensate that? How do you collaborate that? So that's like one of the questions I actually wanted to do. I probably sorry, would have I, I didn't get that. your that part well, sorry. I didn't oh, get you it. didn't hear me. Yes, please. Oh, I, I'm saying Emmanuel have actually mentioned about the um, that iron sphere is one yes. of um, the major difficulties. So how does how do you overcome that, or what's the current um, resolution to that? Yeah. So. You see, sometimes one somebody's poison is another person's meat. <laughs> and there are group here that are also using observing from ten to thirty okay. megahertz. So that is, and then uh, they have all the tools that they can uh, try and clear the data per what they want. We have somebody like uh, uh, what do you call it, Robert. Richard, yes, Richard is doing surveys using the, one of the solar people. So uh, I don't do that, but I know they have tools that they use to uh, analyze their data without having problem with what, and they even get information from the ionosphere based on the tools that they have. Okay. So it's how, what tools you have, and then because people are even observing in the deep of the ionosphere. Okay. The yeah. depth. All right, thank you. Maybe I should pass it on to the rest. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, thanks, thank Sigurd. Those were really good questions. And I think, I mean, just following up a little bit, then as far as I understand it, then, you know, it, it has been really, really difficult to calibrate the very long international baselines at the low frequencies. In fact, it's hardly mm -hmm. been done at all, I think, successfully yet because of the ionosphere. Basically, mm -hmm. everything is moving around very, a lot. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, a quite, it's a very difficult problem. But, you but most think, of them doing, working in that region, normally they use the, the dark stations. They don't include the international ones. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that, that is, but that is a real challenge. So, I mean, basically you need, you know, lots and lots of calibrators all, all, all in the, you know, across above each Depends station. Direction. And uh, yeah. so you need a lot of calibrators in your field of view, basically. Um, is, is, and then more sophisticated algorithms. So the kind of stuff that, well, the Dutch have developed a lot that of new algorithms, right. but also the kind mm. of things that um, uh, Oleg Shmonov is doing in, uh, in roads as well. The, the sort of direction dependent calibration there's a lot there's a lot of a lot of those techniques are being used i think in the, in the low fi oh. data and of course this is really um paving the way you know learning how to handle this data because it's basically mm -hmm. like a new window in the spectrum really uh, observing at these resolutions and sensitivities of mm -hmm. the frequencies and mm -hmm. so it you know a lot has been learnt from LOFAR and the other low frequency arrays around the world. There's, there's another one, the MWA, which is down at the SK site in Australia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're learning how to do the calibration, which will obviously feed into um, SK low when it starts operating. So. Okay. Yeah, and so this, is, this is the most reason why we now have the new astron structure, where we have people in focus groups who are for, for example, algorithm and those things. So they are imaging beam forms. They are going to deal, deal specifically with addressing issues at the different uh, observing modes. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's wrap it up there. We've had, a, I think that's our longest set of questions we've had. So you've set off a, you've set off a good debate, Bernard. So that's always a good sign. <laughs> and uh, thanks to everyone for, um, 
for staying around and, and on the uh, discussion. Uh, a lot of really good questions, a lot of good discussion. Uh, so let me uh, thank Bernard uh, wholeheartedly on behalf of all the audience as usual. Um, many thanks for your talk and uh, you know, good luck with the, uh, the LOFAR2 upgrades and running everything over the next uh, couple of years. It'll be, it's always an interesting time when your telescope is changing around you as well. Um, so that'll be, that'll be interesting. And, uh, you know, obviously keep in touch with the DARA program and, uh, uh, and all things African uh, radio astronomy. And uh, I'm sure we'll all, uh, you know, be in touch with you in, in the future. Yes, yes. So, Thank you very much also for the opportunity. I no problem. Talk to my colleagues. Thanks very much. If you stop sharing your screen, Bernard, I'll just put up the, the, okay. the, 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 the final slide to thank everybody and uh, we'll stop it there. Thank everyone. Mm. All right, thank you. And uh, Marfo? Uh, yeah. How are you? <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> Marco is calling you, come. Marco. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, you, it's a joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought like he, he was there with you and he's calling me. <laughs> oh. <laughs>